My name is Geraldine DeBastian, and I am very much looking forward to moderating this panel session now on the topic of global justice and digitalization. The panel is going to focus on perspectives from the global south on the topic of global justice. And in particular, we want to zoom in to discuss topics around digital colonialism, the existing power structures in today's digital worlds, and what opportunities we might have to change the existing status quo toward a future we think is more desirable. Toward the end of the panel, we also want to try to tie in some of the climate justice topics with the topic of digital justice, and would invite you all to join the conversation by making comments and asking questions. I have three most excellent panelists with me today, and I would like to begin the session by introducing them to you. To my right is Renata Avia, who is the CEO of the Open Knowledge Foundation. She is also an international lawyer, author, and advocate who brings nearly 20 years of experience in the topic of access to knowledge, freedom of expression, policy making, and global digital rights. She is an affiliate with the Stanford Institute of Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence and serves on a number of boards, including the Governing Board of Open Future and the Advisory Board of Creative Commons. She also founded the Alliance for Inclusive Algorithms, the Progressive International and Polylateral Association, and is, as you can see, very busy depending on digital rights online and offline. Thanks for being here with us today, Renata. I have, you can applaud to welcome her if you like. Woo. To my left, I have Gabriel Kazan, who defines himself as a digital dreamer, an internet leader, and activist. Gabriel Real has a background and degree in computer science and several years experience working in the NGO and civil society sector where he is championing the topics of digital literacy and emerging technology adoption through projects such as the podcast he's doing called Dream Internet Voices. And this podcast also led Gabriel to founding the Emerging Youth Initiative, which is a non-profit youth organization boosting egalitarian, safe, and progressive technology uses and adaption in ecosystems. Welcome, Gabriel. It's great to have you here as well. And our third panelist will be joining us online. Nadini Chami is the Deputy Director and Fellow at IT for Change, a nonprofit organization based in India that works on gender equality, social justice, and development justice in the digital economy and society. Nandini's work is focusing on research and policy advocacy in these domains, and particularly addressing corporate power in the digital economy, alternatively, coming up with digital. Um, like I said, imaginaries, so other, op other futures that we can think of, and particularly her work is grounded in Southern feminist epistemologies and the political economy of digital rights. Welcome, Nandini. <laughs> Nandini, I can't see you here on stage, unfortunately. I want to let you know that your screen is behind me, so usually I would have said, like, feel free to give us a wave if you want to butt in any time, but now I'm going to say just open your mic and start speaking to butt in any time in case I'm not calling it you and you want to add something to the conversation, okay? Yeah, thanks. Good to hear you. Yeah, we can hear you super well and see you well too. Perfect. So I would like to um, begin, so a little bit for the format, we're going to do this in two rounds. We're going to begin by discussing the status quo and the power asymmetries that we're facing today. And then in the second half of the discussion, we want to look forward and see how to change the status quo and what opportunities we have that we are already working on today to perhaps also join forces in a broader sense to do that. And like I said, open up to your questions and comments as well. But I'd like to begin by giving everybody a bit of time to talk a bit more about how their work relates to this topic. So maybe, Renata, I can begin with you, as you do many exciting and wonderful things in the area of digital rights, just to speak a little bit how you um, approach the topic of global digital justice and how you're trying to work toward that with the different things that you do. Well, I will focus on the work of Open Knowledge Foundation um, uh, because it is, I think that is the, on my role, multiple roles, I think that is the most 
um, relevant for the conversation that we are having today. And it's very interesting because Open Knowledge Foundation is not new. Uh, uh, it is almost 20 years old. And looking back in time, it was born at a time, uh, 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 at a moment full of hope on, on digitization. At the moment that everybody, those who founded it, like Rufus Pollock and others, were convinced that, you know, like the, 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 the way digitization and global justice will go hand in hand. And it was a optim full of optimism. It was a way of, okay, we, we, and in that time, was a group of academics and activists, like mostly from, from the global north, were very, very, very excited because they were seeing, like, uh, as costs uh, were getting cheaper, uh, knowledge were, uh, 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 was getting more distributed, uh, how tremendous possibilities of accelerate change and, and increase equal access to knowledge and increase possibilities to the many uh, were, were very, very real and not so costly and not so, so complex if we would um, establish different nodes of people with the same purpose in different parts of the world. And so that's the way uh, how Open Knowledge Foundation started. And we basically coined the term open data that now is everywhere. And that culture of openness and, and making, you know, available and accessible um, key infrastructure, key digital infrastructures for everyone. Uh, and principles like decentralization, distributed power, localization were very like embedded in our culture. But uh, that was almost 20 years ago. You know, licensing was very important because the, the bad guys were very different back then. Uh, the bad guys were like the copyright industry and big some are still the bad guys, you know, but then now we, we have a more crowded room of uh, bad guys. Uh, copyright industry, for example, um, a big, big, big blocker on, on this opening knowledge and making it accessible to everybody. Um, of course, uh, uh, another of the uh, bad guys, which is still one uh, whose principles and logic and money-making model has prevailed, is the big pharma industry. It's still there, you know, like... And, but, you know, like uh, the first patch, the immediate patch was to... to um, open up the possibility to share this knowledge. However, uh, and it was not only the Open Knowledge Foundation, other, uh, other uh, foundations and activist groups, we made a strategic mistake that we are now realizing. And the strategic mistake was ignoring that the, all this openness was happening in specific structures of power and that some were uh, getting more benefits than others from this opening up everything. Uh, we didn't attach rules of sustainability and fairness to those um, dynamics of openness. And, and so it resulted in different cycles of exploitation and extractivism and different form of colonization, paradoxically. Uh, um, just to, 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 to fast forward to what we are doing now, we realize that open knowledge is not only about licensing and putting like data sets available online. It is more complex than that. And so one of the parts uh, of our new strategy and part of the mission that we want to do is to basically smash secrecy. Secrecy, is, uh, is, uh, which takes different shapes and forms, is still very present. And it is still blocking possibilities to many. Possibilities of accountability, possibilities of real change, possibilities of scaling uh, the change that we want to see. The second thing that we, um, we are like, uh, working on is removing unnecessary delays and barriers of having this access to knowledge, real access to knowledge. If you think, quick example, if you think of patents and how even if we have today a very good solution to solve a public health issue or to uh, solve, a, you know, deploy a super good technology to uh, accelerate um, the changes that we need to reduce emissions. If it is locked by a patent, it only belongs to the few. And it is against logic of survival even, you know, to lock for 20 years, for 25 years, the innovation that we need right now. 
Uh, so we are also looking into that and looking into like unlocking the innovation that we need to solve the problems of the right now without giving artificial monopolies to very few. And, and the second is like is building real literacy in the groups like uh, we and not, we do not no longer see uh, ourselves as a frontline organization, but as an enabler organization. We know uh, to do two things very well. We know how to create data infrastructures, and we are very good at, with more than eight years of experience, on connecting uh, uh, people to take the full advantage of that uh, open data and reproducible research with uh, tools that are accessible to them. And that can empower environmental groups, that can empower social justice groups, that can connect and link the two to see, for example, how pollution of the air is affecting communities in a specifically geolocated area. And since our tools are by principle interoperable and accessible to all, that can really make help uh, uh, need uh, this global movement. So that's what we are doing in a team, a small team of 15 people in four continents and, and, and an expanded network of different chapters and affiliates in uh, around 45 countries. So that's the not so summary, <laughs> summary of what we are doing at Open Knowledge Foundation. Thank you so much, Renata. You touched upon very important points that I definitely want to circle back to in the course of the conversation, especially as we get to tie in climate justice topics with digital rights topics, this point of locking away innovations, I think is of real key importance. Before we move on, I just want to make a very quick technical question. Is there any way to reduce the hall on stage so we don't hear everything double and out of sync? No. Okay, all right, moving on. <laughs> Nandini, um, IT for Change has been also an extremely important actor um, in terms of uh, digital rights. And I would like you to explain a little bit more about how you do and what your work for global digital justice looks like. Yeah, uh, thank, uh, thank you for that. Um, IT for Change was born in the early 2000s. And the world was full of the optimism of the world summit in the Asian society, and there was the hope that the summit would be a leveler. At that point, the mission of the organization was always centered in, this, in defining what should be the future of the people centered in Fari. And 20 years later, in our research and policy advocacy, one thing was it was we hold this at the center, and it was this that digital justice is not to be included uh, inclusion into connectivity. On the contrary, uh, digital justice is actually about ensuring that connectivity platform data and AI infrastructures are able to pave the way for the enhancement of human development at, you know, through the approach and enable the people of the global south to automatically define their development pathways. And this is what we do in all the work that we do. And this is the vision of digital justice as development justice that we do in our organization. I am guessing that the sound was also semi-okay in the audience, looking at your faces, because it's hard to tell because the sound is kind of weird on stage anyway. <laughs> so, Nandini, I think we got most of what you were saying, but I think it would be great if you can speak super slowly the next time to make sure even more comes across. <laughs> um, um, Gabriel, um, you are working with young people, as I understand, and trying to get an understanding for the means and the value of technology. Can you explain how you work, what your youth organization does, and how the topic of global digital justice relates to your work? Thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Great. Uh, first, I have to say and acknowledge that I am my ancestor's wildest dreams, just to be here sitting with you all discussing global justice as a black man from the global south, but being given and awarded the privilege of being in such a community that stands for equity, openness, and the principles of autonomy is quite important and quite a privilege. I think that's something you should applaud yourself for, so thank you very much. Uh, 
uh, as a young person in this age, I was born in the internet age. As it matures, I mature with it. In my organization, it's important to know how we tackle literacy. We tackle literacy not on the point of the content or the context, but the nomenclature and the social element of it. Because my agency is to understand that true liberty, true equity is gained when someone is actually free. And that's gained through open knowledge that is shared through the digital world, it's shared through open access, being embedded in a network that does not see your color, in a network does that not see your religion or creed, but all together trying to build something stronger and together as a global village, and that's important. So for us in our organization, working with young people, it's more about changing the mindset and changing the narrative to a point of ownership where together we can build and we can get there faster. In matters of climate change, together we can build and we can get there faster. And in matters of a progressive world, together we can build and we can get there faster. So I work tirelessly to form on the aspect of inclusivity and diversity. Because once your voice is heard, when you see yourself through someone, it's easy to translate that into policy, it's easy to translate that into the daily operations of how the digital world works. And these are the important pillars we need to work. I also work in the internet governance space where there is something called the multi-stakeholder model. The multi-stakeholder model is something that actually represents equity where each and everybody, the end user, has a voice in implementing change. And this is something which is driven in a consensus model where we come into an agreement in shaping the evolution of the digital world. I also work at the African Parliamentary Network of Internet Governance. And my job there is to actually contextualize the movement of the world. You know, most of the politicians do have a simple understanding at the content level, but they do not understand the infrastructure behind the technical community, the role of academia, and especially the role of civil society. So working there, we empower these politicians to understand what it means and the power they have to shape the evolution of the digital world and digitization. Because in terms of global justice, legislation is quite important. And when they do have the literacy schemes, when we do have that intersessional and intergenerational dialogue, that is when we can really shape change. And that is how we can have spaces like this. So basically, that is what I do. I am somebody from the internet, working for the internet, and by the internet. Thank you. So let's start untangling the, um, the world we're facing today and some of the problems around that. Um, I'd like to begin by looking at this both from an infrastructure level, but also, of course, from a data level and access to knowledge level, which you've already touched upon in your uh, first intervention. So who owns the internet today and what are the power asymmetries that you're experiencing that make that difficult? If um, I'm going to give this question around, and let's maybe try to attempt to answer it from a global level, but if you want to zoom in on your respective um, national context, maybe especially Nandini and Gabriel, that would be great too. Do you want to start by giving a little bit of a global overview of the current power asymmetries that define our digital spaces? Maybe this is a bit of an introductory statement also for those who are a bit newer on joining the conversation on digital colonialism. So um, if you want to add a bit of an explanation of what the term means, please go ahead. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm always starting. We need to distribute a little bit more. Like, uh, no, but uh, I... Who owns the internet today? Not us, certainly, not the citizens. Um, most of the governance and the ownership of the infrastructure of the internet is in private hands and in private decisions, concentrated in one or two countries. And that's a big, big, big problem. Of if we think of only the pipes, uh, to give you an example, um, the way that Central America, where I come from, is connected, is connected to one cable to go through uh, Arcos, who goes through Miami, basically. And if that, if that cable goes away, the whole connectivity of the region goes away. And most of um, Latin America, for example, if we look at the cables, you know, like uh, the, uh, that basic level of infrastructure is uh, connected through the US. And now there's, an, I mean, the Europeans are very excited that there's, a, you know, the first cable connecting uh, for um, educational purposes is called Bella. Um, um, 
a cable connecting Europe uh, through um, um, Lisbon and Brazil, but it's a very fragile, like, you know, uh, um, infrastructure that is only intending to, like, basically targeting the most uh, developed uh, research centers in Brazil, in Chile, in, in the southern cone, basically. And, and, and that's it, you know, like, and that, if you think of uh, the dependence, you know, like the dependence uh, and it is neo-colonization of uh, my continent that at the, la at the layer of the infrastructure depends absolutely on one cable that belongs to corporations in the U.S. At the hardware level, basically, is belongs half-half to China and the U.S. All the equipment, all the things that we use to connect, it absolutely imported, right? Not produced locally. At the... Um, layer of the apps and services that we use, five companies, all uh, U.S. companies, I mean, uh, I'm not talking about social media, I'm talking about, you know, like the, the main companies that provide the main services that keep our digital infrastructure uh, afloat from hospital services to education services to government in general belong to five companies in the U.S., and so we can, uh, I mean, uh, we can see how uh, Latin America, for example, concretely, depends absolutely in a set of corporations that are in one state uh, where our influence is very, like, you know, little. I mean, um, even if we legislate locally, we have no options. We have no opt-out. And, and, and there's basically, we are in a complex um, um, situation of no alternative. I was just, as you were speaking, thinking, I feel like maybe five or eight years ago, this conversation about the concept of vertical integration, so not just that it's five companies owning everything, but owning everything from the glass fiber cables to the app level. Um, so that's that, that tiered... Um, dominance is, is the concept described as vertical integration. And I feel like there was a much larger conversation around the dangers of that than today. Like it's basically a t term that sort of seems to have disappeared from digital rights conversations. Is that because this is sort of such a stark situation that there seems to be little alternatives, as you just said, or why do you think that is? I mean, I will be very cynical. I think that the, it was um, a lot that the political landscape changed a lot and the discourse changed a lot. And now we are like in this polarized uh, situation of the good, good guys and the bad guys in the conversations in, in digital. And when you we talk about the Global South, we are back to the damn conversation of connectivity and connecting the next billion and we get stuck there. And connecting the next billion to what? When we are at, the, at these multi-stakeholder conversations, we have the saviors, you know, like the same as colonialism, the saviors of Google saying, saying, oh, we will provide you internet, we are going to provide the infrastructure that your government is failing to, to provide. Same with uh, Meta, same uh, with um, now Elon Musk saying, oh, I'm the savior that is going to connect the disconnected. It's a disputed territory because it turns out that all these people who are not connected, it's, it's a very interesting market and it's a very interesting free, uh, source of free labor to train the system that are going to control everything in the future. Yeah. So then they can be like discarded from Already the equation wrote down Starlink earlier when you were talking about the fragility of infrastructure and our dependencies, because of course that's one of the sort of starkest examples of that at the moment. Nandini, and oh, by the way, uh, Nandini and Gabriel and Renata, if I'm not asking you directly, but you want to feel, if you want to jump in and comment, please do that anytime. Um, Nandini, I'd like to ask you next, um, if you can add to what Renata said in terms of describing where you see the starkest power asymmetries, and also perhaps giving a little bit of insight to the Indian context, because I feel we sometimes we, meaning some people, sometimes look at India who romanticize a little bit the idea that the government is creating its own structures in terms of creating, in terms of balancing out this big tech power and trying to create more state-run infrastructures. But of course, there's a lot of criticism around that from um, a civil society perspective. So perhaps you can share some information about that with us too. Uh, yes. 
Uh, if you look at uh, who is actually controlling the internet today, uh, I agree with my response that uh, it's actually big tech. Uh, I want to first uh, talk about a point that uh, Renata was speaking about, uh, which is that if you look at the core infrastructure of the internet, the underwater cables and the content delivery networks, uh, it's the big tech of the US that plays a very critical stay in it today. And I also want to share a short anecdote about four years ago, which I find quite illustrative, that initially the internet as the World Wide Web, as the internet of the hyperlink, it was seen as something that would facilitate sharing these connections. But almost a decade later, after the rise of the internet platforms, we have seen an internet which is just like full of walled gardens. And what does this mean for all the possibilities of transformation and emancipation that we moved about in the early years? Uh, I also want to bring another point uh, before addressing your question about India, and it's this. Typically, we think about how there is a US model of, of internet that is controlled through a multi-stakeholder governance model. And then we look at the Chinese model and say that if we do this and we try to look for an alternative, we will just end up with a state-controlled internet, right? But uh, actually, this is quite misleading because when you look at digital sovereignty and the fact that states have a role to play the creation of digital public infrastructure, uh, I think that there is a third way possible. Uh, and that is where uh, India may offer some parts, though India has not cracked the solution uh, perfectly, uh, because we see that in agriculture or in health or in particular sectoral domains, uh, India is trying to create the basic uh, building blocks of uh, platform data infrastructure that can facilitate local innovation through its national open digital ecosystem project. It's also trying to create standards that are public. Like in the case of the Unified Payments Interface, which facilitates digital banking and digital transfer of payments to happen. But where it's going wrong, one would think, or where it can do more, is to actually build community partnerships and like you know, public community partnerships around which the innovation on these ecosystems can be supported because otherwise there is the danger of replicating and mimicking the very data extractivism that we criticize and try to build uh, alternatives. Uh, I can bring more thoughts later, but I just want to confirm if you could uh, me. Sorry, was, okay. <laughs> um, um, I think I got most of it. Did you guys hear more better this time? It was a bit better, right? Okay, great. Thank you, Nandini. This was a great pace of speaking at, for sure. Gabriel, of course, I want to ask you the same question too, and maybe having heard what your fellow panelists said, how do you feel this relates to the situation in East Africa and perhaps also particularly in Tanzania? Yeah, um from the days of ARPANET, like 30 years ago where the internet was born, it was highly frag fragmented in a way. It's an Americanized model of democracy, and that is true. We still have uh, almost 12 or 13 root servers which are still highly Americanized in the terms of how they should represent the majority of the world, and it's not bad. We have had some points of breaking the digital divide, but the problem is now it is intertwined with their meaning of capitalism and where centralization and centralization of the connection itself, the content, is made for the sake of making profit. While the internet should be public property for each and every one to embed and feel 
represented in that manner. Uh, still, for, for East Africa and for Sub-Saharan Africa, we still have a big internet connectivity issues. The internet is still highly embedded in the philosophy, whether of the West or the Eastern side, and we are forced to choose. If we choose the new democracy American model, that's fine, but we go against the China model, and if we choose the China model, we go against. So Africa is actually in a big dilemma where we are still in that consumer-driven mindset where we are taking the network or the connection as a finished product, but we do not have the right qualification literacy for us to actually create our own network so that the internet can be interoperable and represent each and everybody. That is an important thing. In terms of the government, still, legislation is fragmented when there's a political layer on the Aussie model, and that has been the difficult thing as we see 30 years of the internet come now. But some solutions we see with Web 3.0 where we see decentralization, but still it reinforces to the digital divide because we do not have proper ownership and understanding of what it means to be meaningfully connected from the technical aspect, from the academia aspect, and from a user aspect, who is the core and most important part. So most of the infrastructure is still controlled on the capitalistic driven thematic uh, regions. Most of the content, most of the decisions are made there, and we are forced to embed there for us to actually have access to digital resources or have access to something like that. But still, it creates other opportunities to counteract, but it is quite not enough until we do have ownership of the traffic, of the infrastructure, in a way that we are quite interoperable in parameters of equity, openness, decentralization, and end-to-end, -end, these pillars that created the internet, we're still having a big power dynamic on how we could relate an internet that actually represents each and everybody. And in that regard, we all have our own ways of understanding democracy as the theoretical model and the practical model. So, in the end, a consensus needs to be reached of what it really means to be part of a global village and how we implement that from the infrastructure level in terms of the real network to the level of what it means for us as a community. Maybe we can, before we uh, move on, outline the connection also that exists. Maybe you have a couple of examples um, between the problem that we have very centralized power structures and often not decentralized infrastructures and the possibility that that gives to more authoritarian governments or governments wanting to control their citizens um, and makes their life much easier than if we had more decentralized forms of infrastructure. So for instance, like internet shutdowns or other forms of um, social media control. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, we face this, and it's, it's like a script book that's happening most to African governments right now, that uh, using it, every election comes with an internet shutdown. And why? Why is that? It's just a form of control of how information flows, control of how people should interact and how people should think. This is not a model that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa or Africa actually innovated. They just copy and paste it based on a lot of lobbyists and uh, corporate uh, advice that they were given in how to actually manipulate an election. But once you manipulate an election, you manipulate a people, and you still, you're back to the same indoctrination of colonialism that happened. And it's sad to see when uh, governments actually in the sub-Saharan Africa use that same rhetoric of colonization through the internet. So the internet is a tool that is quite powerful, but the internet is also a tool that can be abused, you know? Abused meaning that it doesn't have meaningful use to the end user. In the end, a democracy is built by the end user. A digital global democracy is built by the voices and representation and diversity of the end user. Digital civil rights are actually quite important, and that has to begin with forming really open dialogues such as this on how we counteract governments using this uh, whatever crony ways to manipulate a population while the intent is actually having a connection that can actually build something together and change the world progressively as we, you know, intertwine as a union and unified humanity. Thank you. Renata and maybe also Nandini, if you want to add some examples. Yeah, I, I want to, like, you know, one of the, when I was thinking about and preparing for this um, uh, connection of global justice and digitization, um, the politics question came to my to, to a central central uh, stage because 
the way that digitization is affecting elections is affecting climate policy and is delaying and making very difficult to achieve the, the, the commitments that we need. Concrete example, Brazil. Brazil and Bolsonaro. I mean, this weekend, I guess that one of the most important elections for our planet is taking place. And at the center of the stage are social media companies fueling, as never before, hate and misinformation. And, and it is very, very, very complex. And of course, the thing is, can we trust the companies? And can we trust the companies that they will be like neutral and they will not sell themselves to those who can pay with favors and with money the most? Can we, can we also be certain that the U.S. will not med, med, uh, meddle in the election through the companies that they control? And can we, can we be certain that those who own the companies will not favor the candidate that would make their lives easier operating in one of the most important markets in the world. And unfortunately, like if I was sitting at the like, you know, uh, uh, electoral authority of Brazil, I would not be able to be certain that they are not meddling in an election and they are not like causing, they're not suppressing votes, that they are not like doing lots of nasty things. Why? Because I have no access to the set of instructions that are like dictating which information is displayed to my citizens or not. And then you go to the other extreme because like, you know, the extreme that some uh, countries take is to simply shut it down. And, and of course, it is a move that is authoritarian, but at the same time, what do you do? You know, like if, if you are like, you know, in a country where you are like aware and have hard evidence that the actions or omissions or the toxic algorithms by, by a company are like, you know, fueling hate and, and leading to real life, you know, like um, confrontations and even assassinations, what do you do? You know, like, and, and it is, you know, we are like kind of trapped in this conversation that the only way to communicate and exercise our right to freedom of expression is through these damn companies. And it, it, unless we either, like, you know, they change their model and they show us everything are subject to very high standards of scrutiny, or we decentralize and sim simply abandon them, we will be in this in this dynamic that is only getting worse. A uh, quick example was, um, the, it, it was very sad, one of the most progressive uh, constitutions for the environment and for people was about to be approved in, in Chile. The level of misinformation and disinformation spread to social network played a tremendous role in, um, the, uh, in, in the citizens voting against a constitution that was good for people, good for the planet, good for social justice. So we cannot isolate the effect, the harmful effect these companies are having and the responsibility of digital rights organizations to get it right uh, uh, in, um, in moving, moving to the next step. I am very concerned about it and I mean, seriously, I cannot, I, I cannot think of better solution but you know, like, a, really creating the alternatives, decentralized, interoperable, green alternatives that we need. We need to get out of them, basically. We cannot fix, we cannot patch. It is too late, and we cannot depend on something that we cannot see. We cannot have faith on corporations. It's a really important point you made. I think really of central importance to the debates that we're having right now, because I find myself a lot, a, conversations at the intersections of um, climate justice, climate advocacy, and, and, and our digital realms, let's say, and this idea that we cannot create the change that we need to save our planet fast enough, but at the same time, of course, do not want to uh, see this as an undemocratic endeavor, so we need to move with the democratic systems we have, and that means electing the right parties. I'm just repeating what you said now, but if our democratic systems are being undermined, by um, the powers that you just described, then we're not going to be able to create that political environment to create the change. And that's um, a very dire situation to be stuck in. Um, Nandini, do you have any examples you also want to add from your side on the um, effects that you're seeing in correlation between 
power asymmetries, infrastructure control, platform control, data control, and, um, and how that is surfacing in, in the Indian society or beyond. I would uh, like uh, to add uh, one point uh, to what Renata said. Without addressing uh, data extractivism, we cannot recover the internet. And I want to draw attention to how digital trade agreements are very important to look in this regard. The, the provisions that are being negotiated in the digital trade agreements, including in the free trade agreements that European Union signing with countries of the global south will prevent the scrutiny of the algorithms of the social media operations, which will prevent us from uh, addressing situations like the one that Renata mentioned. And we should also look at how these companies using their algorithmic power uh, are controlling agriculture, they are controlling labor markets, and they are controlling pretty much every aspect of economic activity uh, today. Like for example, in India, we have uh, concerns that farmers' movements are actually talking about the alienation and capture of farmers' data by, let's say, big tech companies and other intermediate data brokerage companies, which might potentially open up the agricultural smallholder farmer market to big agriculture and big tech. And so, uh, if we have to talk about corporate accountability and holding the big tech corporation accountable, uh, I think the first thing we should be talking about is how we need to get out of the equal footing multi-stakeholderism model uh, of internet governance uh, that has come in forums such as the IGF. Thank you. Um, is, did you want to add anything to the trade agreements point? I uh, just agree on that, and on top of that, the next generation of trade agreements uh, to my first point that I re referred to in the introduction of secrecy. Trade secrets on steroids for the next generation of um, trade uh, agreements that your representatives are supporting as a block, as the European Union. So all the blah, blah, blah of Green New Deal and green technologies for all, and all is empty talk. Because in the Global South, your leaders are imposing these rules that will impede us from even auditing whatever you are doing in our countries, let alone share the benefits of your innovation so we can scale solutions rapidly. Just that. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, um, we have touched on just a few of the potential topics that we could be touching upon when we talk about digitization and global justice and the power asymmetries. We have not even really begun to talk about uh, the data asymmetries um, and, and the effects of the gig economy and platform economy. So this is a conversation we could be having for another couple of hours. But looking at the time, as I said in the beginning, we also want to try to look ahead. Now, this is a very kind of not easy point of departure after you just said it's all too late. We need to scrap all the social media platforms. So we'll get back to that in a minute. But um, seeing that this is the world that we're facing, and as I understand, maybe we'll start with you, Gabriel, because I understand that you are very much working particularly with this demography of young people who are trying to reimagine their digital futures. Um, but of course, it needs to be acknowledged that we're facing these really stark power asymmetries, and it is not easy to break out from them. So where's your kind of vision or your hope, and what is it that you're trying to work towards with your organization in this regard? Um, five point. Zero three billion people are connected right now in a single internet that has the nomenclature in context with protocols that we all abide to. It's that abstract level where it's, I can just take a phone or a computer and go to the internet and make impact or change my life. But now that is under threat. 
just because of the corporate uh, greed as well as the political layer of influence. But we have an opportunity of decentralization that comes up. As young people, we should stand first for a unified digital front. Because if I might ask you, dear audience, what is the color of the digital world? What is its religion or political affiliations? Not there, but we know the impact and the purpose. And for something to be purposeful, to be meaningful, someone should know how it operates in their regard. For us young people, we are first fighting for a unified internet for all in terms of inclusivity, diversity, accessibility, and affordability to know that we are connecting the next billion from the global south. We need a global internet that actually speaks the language, represents its sake, and that is important. We, we see organizations such as ICANN working for internationalized uh, domain names uh, rather than just the Latin scripts. That is important. We need first an internet that can actually understand different diverse opinions, not only from how it looks like in the AI models, but how it actually speaks, it writes, and the content inside. That is important to know because now we also have content moderation, and that is a big topic that people are afraid to talk about. Content moderation, for me, I think it's a form of indoctrination and trying to control your thoughts. It's good when we kind of filter something, but it's important to actually stand for those freedoms of expression and those freedoms of thought that we are awarded by, by being connected. That is important. As young people, we are fighting to create innovative spaces that are equally distributed. Web 3.0 is part of the solution, but still, in the global South perspective, we are still fathering the digital divide because it only happens here. So we can only do this with intergenerational alliances based on the dialogues we have, open expression we need, and actually creating a framework of accountability where the internet stands for the liberty of the end user. And the communities of end users advocate in having a concrete voice to fight for an internet that is more open and more useful and meaningful for the next generation. So, <laughs> um, how do we, you know, that is a beautiful vision, of course, we've all worked in so many spaces where the power of technology for good is so incredibly apparent, um, as you also explained, you know, the history and, and genesis of the Open Knowledge Foundation and the important work that it's been doing. Um, but having come from the conversation that we've just had now, you know, the idea like, okay, we need to scrap it all <laughs> and reboot. But if we don't have the money or the partners to do that, like how is that going to look like? Where can we begin to reimagine these structures? I, I, th I think that then inequalities come to the center, right? And it is, we need to really change the, I mean, the thing is like maybe from what I have been saying, I sound like someone who does not like technology very much. I actually do like it and I still work in the field because I still believe in the in tremendous power of change. Uh, the thing is that we need to rethink which technology for what. And, and then when we fix our priorities as a community and as a society, we need to like, you know, target our investments and do not waste on distractions, you know, like uh, which technologies for what. If, if, I, if we are thinking about that um, at the foundation and we were like, which technologies for what, one of the most important barriers for good, for example, it's a concrete example, for good climate policy is to have, you know, real-time data. And most of the governments, even in the developed world, are dealing with um, data of three years ago or four years ago, we cannot decide on, with changing circumstances that are so fast and that are affecting directly our communities, we cannot, we can, we really, you know, the first upgrade, the first and basic upgrade that we would need is to build capacities and, and develop, you know, like uh, the cheapest, leanest, greener uh, technologies that will enable, uh, easiest, easier to use, that will enable even the, small, uh, uh, the smallest uh, unit in local governments to be, produ be able to collect and produce the data that we need for critical things. Uh, that's just an example, you know, and if we look at the budgets, 
at the moment, if we study the, the national budget and the, uh, um, most, a lot of money is going to big tech. And I think that, I think that um, um, we cannot say that, you know, like uh, that we, if the, the things are functioning, like, you know, uh, to provide infrastructure for, you know, like uh, the, the vanity infrastructure of certain social media. We need to rethink our priorities as a society, as a, as a society and re, reinvest in the critical things that we need right now. Uh, I think that the solidarity commitment uh, that needs to come from the global north is again opening up the innovations that we, you are developing and using right now so we can adapt uh, adopt and adapt them locally because in, at the end of the day your survival depends on our survival as well and we need the best information possible as a human collective uh, but but um, in my in, I, I don't have I, to be honest I don't have a plan and I don't have numbers and I think that is something that the community the public policy community the community working for social justice and for climate justice and the digital rights communities need to sit at the table and have the numbers and have a plan for it um, and I think that that plan is missing I think that uh, I think that we have been uh, distracted a lot and or you know spread so thin a lot in so, such subtopics you know uh, as, as so, for example the effect of a specific technology in it's like you know tiny little like, you know corners and we need to like you know get back as a community to work on the global picture and, uh, and to have a basic plan I don't know how and I don't know how, how, how to make it happen but it needs to happen very soon yes it does thank you um, Nandini, how is IT for Change trying to reimagine or support communities in their efforts to reimagine digital structures and where do you see possibilities for intervention in the Indian context or also beyond? Yeah, I think that uh, in order to uh, reclaim uh, the power of the internet, there are two things that we have to do. We have to separate the question of how do you reclaim the internet as a translocal public sphere from the question of how you leverage the power of data for maximizing social value and for ensuring that public good is truly achieved. Uh, what do I mean by that? Typically, when we talk about the regulation of the internet platforms and the internet public sphere, usually we get into this very unhealthy binary between talking about preserving the global internet and preventing internet fragmentation or splinternets, right? But I think this is probably the wrong way to answer that question. And so, at some level, we need to be asking the question, why do we need a platform model of the internet at all? Why do we need walled gardens? Why is it not possible to recover the transformative power of the hyperlink? And like social media scholars like Ethan Zuckerman and others have pointed out, why can't we build a truly decentralized, interoperable social media, media architecture and whose normative governance would probably be something that is grounded at a global level in terms of human rights principles? to guard against the excesses of both uh, state and corporate power. So this is one point. The second point, which I think has to be tied to the development aspirations of the global south and the autonomous aspirations of development of the peoples of the south have to be respected, is this particular point. And on this, we are doing some work in India where how do you actually create models that will leverage data value without mimicking data extractivism and without being Luddite and completely rejecting data and the power of knowledge generated from data insights for enhancing productivity, right? So with farmer communities in two or three sites in India and in partnership with social enterprises and cooperative federations, IT for Change is piloting an alternative model 
that is actually trying to use the power of data for expanding workers' own autonomy, farmers' own decisions about farm enterprise productivity for sustainable small-scale farming. And in this regard, we are also studying this interesting experiment that the state government of Kerala in India is doing, where it's actually piloting a platform with smallholder farmers in one district where the farmer producer organization and the local panchayat, which is the uh, last uh, you know, local government institution, there is an attempt to create a platform commons infrastructure. And the whole idea is that across the entire farm production cycle at every stage from input support to advisories to market linkage and to ensuring blockchain traceability for ensuring the organic farming certification of the farmers participating in this experiment, the state is doing something. And I feel that the public community partnerships and the public worker organizations partnership, where we are talking about a network data scale that enables efficiencies to be achieved through federation rather than through centralization so that we go back to the true generator power of network data infrastructure that is the platform. The quest is really for an alternative platform firm. Yeah. <laughs> I think all of that was really cool to hear and, and extremely well understandable. Also, thank you, Nandini. In particular, also that it is possible to reimagine an internet that is not based on the platform model that we have today. And I think that's exciting to hear. Um, how does that relate to some of the conversations that you're having in terms of not just seeing access perhaps as something to uh, be limited to physical, uh, to access to the internet per se, but also access to the right kind of data to work with, the possibility to have that seat at the table as you were also talking about in the multilateral context earlier, Gabriel? For most of the sub-Saharan Africa, we are buying a model called community networks. This is an alternative model of connectivity that is actually embedded in the community values. We are using TV white spaces to boost connectivity and most of the ownership structure is for the people and embedded through them. So it comes as a package of where you're giving them the infrastructure as well as the literacy combined together to see how much they can actually connect. So it's not a matter of being embedded to this ISP or whatever, it's just your community creating a whole new ecosystem of being connected in an interoperable network and that is something that has quite worked. In terms of financing, there are also alternative ways of financing for you to be connected. Community networks do not need for you to have a financial incentive for you to get there, but they're trying to see how they could use other, other means of financing such as agricultural commodities or credit-based mechanisms just for the sake of people understanding what it means to be meaningfully connected. And community networks, I think, are quite a new frontier in regard that you actually teach the community how to create a network, how to utilize a network, and how to empower themselves with the connection. And that is uh, a model that is quite working for now. We also have other models which are brought uh, in terms of private and public, but public non-profit partnerships uh, in creating more connectivity, such as uh, we have SpaceX coming in with the new technologies of, in terms of rural areas. This is something we're working with in, at uh, Omuka Hub in boosting more connectivity for the rural region. But still, the most important thing is it's intertwining with the literacy scale. Because when you don't understand something, you really cannot utilize it. So for community networks, it's a big platform and it's an alternative model that has uh, been a success story for most of the communities in the Global South. I'm really glad that you just mentioned this topic, Gabriel. I'm going to um, just add something to that very quickly because I think there are so many conversations that we can still be having that are just starting to blossom now at the intersection of our communities. And this is a really great one. So in, I run this NGO called the Global Innovation Gathering and we just had this online sharing session with the APC network together. So a community that brings together a lot of these wonderful community uh, network initiatives. And we were talking about 
about things like building um, towers to put your connectivity devices on out of bamboo and regenerative materials and how to create them with local resources. But we're also having a conversation about the energy saving that can be done by using community networks where appropriate and seeing how the combination between community networks and then, of course, linkages to the internet can be seen as part of, a, yeah, of, an, of an energy consumption and creation discussion as well. So I think there's a lot of potential in these conversations, uh, as I said, in the linkages between our global um, climate justice and digital rights communities. I want to, as we're now sort of moving into that um, final topic of the conversation, get back to something that you said in the very beginning, because this is, I think, also such a key aspect. Um, and, and with this, maybe also look at what are our asks to governments here, also in, in the German context, we're in European context, but also to other governments that might be willing to listen. So at the moment, I feel we have this very strong idea that we can get over the global problems we're facing through innovation. A lot of people are pushing this narrative that we might be able to combat uh, climate change because we're building all these great carbon capture technologies, because we're creating other kind of technologies that will help us through this crisis. However, what you said in the very beginning is just what I think is key in this, it will be impossible for the unlock these innovations in the proprietary domains of individual companies and have no way of making them accessible wider to the world. So where do we break through that innovation narrative and create meaningful ways of open access and, and, and therefore perhaps actually in, harness this power of innovation f to stop climate change? I mean, it, I think that it goes to, it's a money question, basically. It's a money and a rules question. The fir first, the money question is, like, if you look how innovation, so-called innovation is, who's receiving the funds for innovation right now, especially in digital? It goes massively to lots of, uh, you know, profit-oriented startups that are still in the old model, in a destructive model, and, and they have, like, Absolutely, like, you know, they have one mission, you know, like be as interesting and uh, as su successful enough so you will be eaten by a Silicon Valley corporation. And that will be like, you, that's your, you know, like yeah, your big success. Your big success is to be acquired by someone else, even abroad, you know, like if you think of European funds. And if you look at the budget that goes to digital social innovation, is tiny, it's like super, super little tiny, you know, like it's, 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 it's the funds allocated for citizens to start like thinking of collective solutions that have not profit as the main goal, but had like, you know, like a, actually um, progress in mind uh, to, towards the, the goals that we have as communities. It's, it's like a lot needs to be done on more funds allocated better with different rules attached to that kind of innovation. I mean, uh, I have to recognize that the European Union has done a lot in uh, funding projects like uh, uh, Decode, that was like, it all is open source, or is it there for people to innovate. But after, after a nice project the last two years, what happens? Uh, we need also to allocate the funds so these nice prototypes can be localized in communities. And in communities in the Global South, when I see, like, you know, the cooperation, the cooperation agreements with the Global South of, uh, from the European Union often comes with a clause that you have to hire and you have to use European companies to implement. So it's not really cooperation, it's a way to open markets, basically, uh, uh, without competition uh, for the countries in the Global South to, to create the solutions. The, big, the other big problem that we have is patents. Uh, I don't know why we haven't, I mean, it's incredible that the European Union actually blocked the possibility to have vaccines for all, even the US accepted to open the vaccines. And it was um, uh, when, when I was involved in my early 20s in the TRIPS negotiation, um, I was like, you know, there was this clause that I was always a, a skeptical, a skeptical about of exceptions and that a global pandemic will be an exception and will trigger this possibility to have, like, you know, equal access for all as fast as possible uh, in terms of uh, vaccines. It didn't happen. 
I think that when, as we move forward and, and start, like, you know, enacting le legislation for climate change, we need those clothes. This, we need uh, to rethink how we are pro uh, protecting ideas from scaling. And if I think of, for example, okay, innovation should be like compensated, fine. Okay, let's, let's give them money in advance if you're like having really a good solution that can scale. Let's, let's, you know, let's open it as soon as possible for as many people as possible so we can reach the goals. I, I believe that we, if we play by the same, rule, same rules that we have today, we will not overcome the difficulties that we have. And the other is the secrecy of corporations, you know, like uh, uh, back in time it made maybe sense for some that Coca-Cola will keep, like, you know, secret their formula. Right now, the systems are so complex that not even if they were open would be like easy for us to understand what's going on behind closed doors. Not only that, there's, it's very difficult to audit the emissions of companies, even tech companies and other companies, because we like the information that they're making available is selective, and be, because the trade secret laws gives give, give a corporation that has sometimes more power and more influence in climate policy than a whole country the ability to hide what is really going on behind closed doors. So if we don't rethink transparency, rethink the obligations of uh, access to information that a corporation should have uh, to citizens, and rethink uh, the, the uh, agile forms of, inno uh, of innovation, we will not um, overcome uh, the, the greatest challenge of our time. Yeah, thank you so much. I would have, I would have applauded there if I were you. <laughs> um, and looking at um, this from a private funding as well as from a public funding point of view, you were speaking about earlier um, all this money going into deep tech. So this is something also I think if we look at where's VC money going, but also where's development money going, going into startups and going into funding innovation in the African continent, you can see this big run for the fintech sector like everywhere else and there's so much money going into fintech startups, into crypto startups and very little money seems to be going in from these R&D and startup funding cycles into other um, more access giving, more democracy building systems. Where would you wish to see a change in these funding cycles and in these innovation um, focused programs, Gabriel? Um, as much as it's a financial issue, it's also a capacity issue. Uh, Immanuel Kant once said, uh, politics without policy is empty and policy without politics is blind. And most of the times policy is blind to this area's especially when money is part of the conversation. I'll tell you a small story about Naomi. We had a connected African girls coding camp in Dar es Salaam where the goal was to bring these young ladies from rural regions who did not know anything about digitalization or connectivity, but to give them that space to innovate and see. We had a really small budget, but the end product really was inspiring. We, we had 10 girls from rural regions, uh, 10 girls who were visually impaired and some of them were deaf. They actually created smart systems which were powered by solar. You know, for us, when we talk about policy, we say like, we, we, we are lacking funding, we're, we're doing this, we're doing that. But for them, it was more important to get the skills and empower themselves. Because I asked Naomi, you come from a place where there is no electricity. How will you charge your tablet? How will you use these skills? She said, uh, it's okay, I have solar, we, we can build our own turbines, and for me it was crazy, I was like, wow, these are the solutions which we need. So civil society, an informed civil society should get the funding first, and private, public partnership with civil society should be incentivized more than they go to startups, because you go for fintech, that's all right. You go for creating these innovation startups, that's all right. But until we create more girls like Naomi who actually have the capacity, where you can actually see the funding have impact on their community, then we can solve the problems. Because Naomi understands that, you know, we live in a challenging world with climate change. She doesn't know about electricity, all the abstraction, but she knows that with the skills that can actually change the world. And that came through a partnership and funding directly 
to the society and the civility and the end user. And Naomi was able to change the world and change her perspective. So these fundings should be highly equated in terms of empowering the marginalized community who actually will have the solutions we need. Because for us, and some part I might say, we are already indoctrinated by this policy development systems where we might think, you know, it's a complex structure, this and that, but actually empowering them with the financing and the capacity, we can find the solutions, and that is the beauty of diversity. Absolutely, Gabriel. I think that's such an important point that you just made. That is the question we should be asking ourselves. Like, what does Naomi need to have the access to the information, access to um, then also share and scale her idea without it being bought up and locked away by the next corporate? So thanks so much for bringing in that example. Nandini, maybe over to you before we open up for questions. Um, do you want to add any points to this conversation about the different R&D systems we need, the different innovation cycles we need, or perhaps also expand bit on the point of uh, data autonomy that you were making earlier and how, how we can connect that conversation. Uh, yeah, I, I just had uh, two quick points to uh, add. Uh, so uh, firstly, uh, I think that uh, when we are looking at uh, responsible digital innovation that will address the climate change crisis, we need to seriously start looking beyond the carbon-free energy pledges of big tech. Because if you just look at a report from last year of how Alphabet Inc., the three TG minerals, gold, tantalum, and tungsten from the Amazon belt, uh, flouting uh, most of the guidelines, including the OECD due diligence directive on the mining of such rare earth minerals, uh, then we are actually wondering what is it that we are talking about, you know, when uh, 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 ensuring these carbon-free energy pledges and we should be talking about how do you actually do, uh, hold a uh, big tech accountable for their environmentally uh, destructive uh, practices so we should be doing something there uh, secondly, I wanted to call attention to this uh, entire field of synthetic biology where many of you might have read about this somewhere that the World Economic Forum has launched this initiative called the Earth Bank of Codes where the idea is that the database which contains the genetic uh, codes of every single organism that has ever lived on earth, right? Plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, microorganisms, and so on. And if you have such an open genetic repository, but as Renata was pointing out earlier, digital gene sequencing techniques and other things which will enable innovation from this repository and the enclosure of the intelligence and the analytics and the pharmaceutical knowledge and other developments derived from it, that's going to lead to a lot of inequitable innovation. And we are actually talking about the enclosure of the BIOS and the life world itself. And and that we should be highly concerned about in terms of climate change, because what would it mean if such inequity persists in terms of control over the bios? And finally, the last point, uh, I think that if unless we get out of the venture capital funding model, uh, we will not be able to do innovation that is grounded in the social good. And it is not just interested in furthering data extractivism and here I think I come back to an agenda that we have often stopped talking about because you know most of us are tired and it sounds boring and things like that which is the question of official development assistance. What about the question of official development assistance to the south for building autonomous platform data and AI infrastructure when clearly the entire market route of technology transfer has not worked in the digital technology space and shouldn't we be having this conversation since the summit of the future is just two years away at the UN level and it has been nearly 20 years since the visits but we have not progressed at all on this and instead we seem to believe in some happy-go-lucky multi-stakeholder models where some combination of private financing and community partnerships will lead to technological innovation that is equitable and sustainable so we should probably be going back and looking at these assumptions. Thank you. Extremely important points added. It's just like, oh my goodness, 20 years since visas. But yeah, that is true. So let's take a couple of questions. Um, you may raise your hand and we will try to find a way to come to you with a microphone. Comments and interventions, all welcome. 
I will wait a moment to overcome shyness, and I see a hand come up. So I'm now going to, is this, are you, is that okay, or shall I go? Hello, I'm Agnes. I'm leading the Hexen of the CCC. And I actually have a question. Um, I'm also a scientist, so I do have the background, for example, in bioinformatics. Actually, I think the innovations are already done. It's just about getting them where they should be, right? So it's about making it, getting it done, making it real everywhere. And I was wondering if uh, I had now, I listened to the last 30 minutes, if you were focused very much on innovations that are in the future, this makes you um, unable to see that you actually should be doing something. And I was wondering, would you have one or two more practical um, orientations for the people in the room so that they do something, so that we try to get our minds away from thinking about the next innovation, especially carbon capture, let's just not think about that one. <laughs> So you mean concrete things we should be asking, especially governments for now, um, that they need to do now, right? As concrete as possible, because I think this is the thing that's lacking actually. We have already lots of science on the ground. We just need to do it. But what should we do as the first three points or so? Cool, does anybody want to take that first? Yeah, I'll definitely take it. Uh, first of all, we need to understand that it should be beyond the government question, because democratic governments are made by us. We are the ones with the power. So for you to make change, start sharing, creating partnerships with local initiatives, with local, uh, with local NGOs, with local civil society movements, so we can have this open transfer of knowledge based at a very grassroots level. That is important. At the government level, we should reinforce how open data is transferred from one area to another, where we have concrete uh, sharing, sharing exchange capacities points. We see that the EU has quite a good framework of exchanging capacities, and they, we really need more incent incentives, and we really, more, really need more uh, innovations in the space of exchanging capacities and literacy, especially from having women in tech like you sharing to areas such as the sub-Saharan area when what we could do and the innovations that are possible because through that lens we could actually make the change that we need but your voice will count and you're the one to actually initiate it. Nandini, did you get the question like what do we need now from our governments? What would be your answer? Yeah, say that we are in a very difficult spot which makes the technical laying out of very conc clear concrete steps difficult because what we are dealing with is a moment of discourse capture as far as the fight for an equitable digital order is done. So everywhere there is the idea that, you know, as long as we do global data flows with the trust, there will be a market that is privacy and basic first generation human rights protecting and the market will do its job and innovation will happen. This is the mainstream discourse in the digital space that we are up against. So again and again at the multilateral level, Level and with our own governments back home, we are in a moment where we actually have to reclaim the space to talk about the fact that public investment in digital infrastructure, because that is the meaning of developing the digital as a global public good. Uh, we have to re-establish this message and we also have to re-establish the message that just because the internet was born in a very unique historical way, uh, it does not mean that equal footing multi-stakeholderism governments and corporations are sitting at the table and deciding what happens to the internet is the way to make rules for digital economy and society. So I feel a lot of what we are saying here when it comes to reclaiming the digital may sound a little bit lose a little bit like you know ambiguous but that is because I feel it's the, the battle is about a battle of like discursive power and we are challenging the neoliberal hegemonic vision of how the data paradigm should be and this is the most important fight because like the fight against the historical colonization teaches us unless you are able to claim epistemic freedom and reclaim these alternative imaginaries, the fight on the ground cannot uh, succeed. 
A lot of mic drop moments in MTV statements today. What would be your asks? I mean, I have very little to, to add to, to them, but I would say that um, a very simple step, very concrete step, is pushing the universities and the institutions that we uh, work on. Uh, number one, to make uh, research reproducible, but really reproducible. Uh, it is like the numbers of scientists making the data sets that they based the research on uh, open and usable is very, very, very limited. Uh, and that would make a big difference for uh, researchers in the Global South to understand you know, your methodology, how you came up with, to the conclusion and apply it locally. Uh, the second thing is make like, you know, the possibility of uh, human exchanges real. Um, I think that the sharing skills and you traveling to the countries, but also people from the countries where you know, like the, the solutions are needed urgently, traveling to the centers of innovation is very needed. And personally, with my team, I have hell to bring them to Europe, for example. Or uh, it, it is so tragic that, you know, like that we still have the main barrier, okay, free flow of data, super restricted flow of people, you know, like, and, and you will never get, you know, uh, different sides of uh, how to localize solutions, technical solutions, if we, know, if we do not make fair migration rules, you know, like, it, 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 it takes four months and many no's to, for example, my staff in the Philippines or my, my, my uh, staff in Nepal to come. I mean, it, it should, like, you know, it is a very fundamental thing, like pushing for better rules to, of exchange of knowledge in, in the form of sitting together at the table and looking at your solutions and saying, like, oh, actually, that would not work in my country, is very, very, very important. And, and the third is localizing. I mean, like, uh, uh, we live in an English-dominated world, and even if, you know, like, uh, it, there's so, so much lost in translation and, and uh, so a lot of knowledge that is not really reaching the places that uh, need, to, uh, need to reach, you know, so uh, advocating for budgets of uh, translation and localization is a very small thing, but it makes a big difference uh, to have uh, materials of the latest, of the latest knowledge at least accessible in as many languages as possible. Um, just three, three very simple and concrete things that we can do to use the power of digital and but also the power of people uh, to, to scale the innovations that we need. Thank you. Any, well, maybe we have time for perhaps one more question, if there are any other hands going up. Uh, maybe short comment, sorry for my English. Um, I had the impression that uh, your opinion is that maybe basically what Renata said, that uh, big companies that control internet uh, represent directly um, US interest. I have different view. I think that uh, this is just a tool that can be used by different powers for different reasons. And there is a matter of value. I mean, in... Um, Internet was used by Trump to destroy uh, American democracy. It's used by Putin to, to, to destroy democracy in, in Europe. It's, it was used uh, in the Brexit process. It's a simple tool, so it's a matter of value. It's a matter of who is using this tool. And what we can do is, first of all, to protect our values, democracy, and then have some hope that uh, in this environment we can influence somehow who is using this tool and for purpose. That's why I see this opposition that you say more about uh, who is controlling the internet and, and Gabriel is saying more about uh, providing more connectivity. So because that, that it's, it might be hope or disaster, and put it briefly because I know that there's no time for that, um, because there was nothing about Chinese companies, Russian companies here, there was no this perspective. So if I had a choice to live in Beijing, Moscow, or New York, I still prefer to live in New York because there is more chance that I can do something. Thank you. And there is a war close from here. There is a threat of using uh, nuclear weapons. I never heard about this in this conversation. So it's quite strange for me that so close from Russia uh, and these threats that are posing by them, uh, there is nothing about this here. 
we are not having a conversation about that topic matter, otherwise that would have maybe featured. So I didn't quite understand the comment on the threat of nuclear war, which is, as you can imagine, for people living in the city, very much on everybody's mind um, in a current and historical sense. So uh, I do think we did mention China briefly. Do you want to have a circle on the panel to talk, uh, to just give a little bit of a reflection on what the gentleman said about the other um, sort of yeah, forces up against. I do think, if I understood your comment correctly, that we are very much in line with what you said in terms of wanting to build a digital future that is based on our democratic values and that the definition of that needs to also be part of a global conversation and exchange so that that's not dominated by few people again, but really a global undertaking, just as a quick reflection. Um, as just quickly, technology is not neutral, it's political, and it's influenced by politics, as we have seen uh, uh, in the concrete examples that you gave. And it cannot be like you're only regulated by market rules because it is too important, like, you know, like as we can say, if someone has the money to pay an influence, it is, it, 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 it is wrong. I refer to the concrete case of Latin America. In Latin America, the influence of Chinese companies is still minimal, and is, I mentioned it to the hardware layer. I didn't mention, um, I'm, I'm very lucky, and uh, we are very lucky in Latin America that um, at the moment, you know, like most of all, we are like a region of peace, and most of the armed conflicts are like uh, de-escalating. But we made a mistake not to not to mention other conflicts, ongoing conflicts in the global south, as if you think of Yemen, as if you think of the situation in Afghanistan, for example, and so on. I think that we also do not speak enough of real com ongoing conflicts for years and decades that are in the rest of the world and are as, as not as close to Europe, uh, but as relevant. But this was a panel dedicated to the global south, so I focus on that. And, and on, on the point of the relevance of Russia and China and so on and, and the companies, what we have in Latin America, and it's good that you, you mention it, is very complicated because, for example, in the case of some countries, they have embargoes. So they have to circumvent the embargo to keep the countries connected by opting to the countries that will sell them uh, access to the hardware and software they need to function. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of a concrete case of Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, uh, regardless of what you think of uh, the political uh, governments, citizens in, the, citizens in those governments have a, a, right, and, uh, a right to access, right? And, and which is like a uh, right to work and so on that is completely cut by sanctions. So it's very complex and it's all interlinked. And I really hope that we move uh, very soon to a world that is not dependent on uh, who controls the, the weapon arsenals and, and, of course, the effects of, uh, of this uh, European war that is not the only war and it's not the only armed conflict going on in the world right now. It's having ter terrifying effects on the food security and, and on the geopolitics of many fragile uh, societies. And, of course, it's a cause of concern and it's a cause that we could spend the rest of the day discussing. But I'm afraid we have run out of time. We have time for applause. Um, so maybe just as a tiny, tiny, limited to 30 seconds each closing round, is there something that you want to shout out to the audience in case they want to follow your work and keep part of the conversation that we've had here in regard to yeah, your respective workplaces? Anything you want to plug, Gabriel? Uh, definitely. For me, the internet should be a human right and we should have internet for all because that's the only way we can truly be equal and cultivate a intergenerational alliances. So for me, I'm active at Omuka Hub. You should see as the director, Gabriel Castle also on Twitter. So you could follow and see what you're trying to do. And I'm really open to speaking to you to see how we could form collaborations. And I thank you so much for the privilege of having me here. Awesome. Thank you. Nandini, anything that you want to plug? Any exciting pieces of research coming out or other activities of IT for Change or anything else you want to share with the audience? Yeah. 
Uh, I just wanted to quickly say that uh, typically uh, we tend to polarize the US and uh, China model without actually looking at the facts of how Chinese companies are most dominant in their internal market and also not looking at the fact of why countries in the global south opt for the digital silk road because it seems the lesser of the two evils. And my last point is that for progressive organizations like uh, IT for Change in the global south, what we uh, what we would want to emphasize is that when we are talking about a new digital sovereignty, third way human rights approach that the EU will lead, it's equally important that the digital sovereignty of countries in the south are also respected. So what's happening in the domestic market and what EU negotiates in the trade agreements in our analysis from a progressive perspective, we need to look at like both these parameters when we are talking about digital sovereignty, because it's not a simple end of history type of question about liberal capitalism or like, you know, some authoritarian communist version of the internet. Thank you. And just as, as a final remark, another uh, digital future is possible. It is learning already a lot from the uh, environmental and sustainability communities. And it is happening, and it would happen in different forms and shapes that hopefully will be uh, uh, tools to decentralize power and to interconnect efforts to save our planet. Thank you all so much for this really exciting discussion, and all of you for coming out this early on a Saturday morning. Thank you for moderating.